Welcome to my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm Tom West. Uh, the name of the YouTube channel is Life in the God Lane. I hope you'll push the little red subscribe button, subscribe to it, send it to someone you care about so they can subscribe to it and hear a message from the Bible that will encourage them and lift them up. This is an extra one. This is a sermon I prepared some time ago for a, a church in Porterville, California. And I call it Straighten Me Out. Straighten Me Out. There's a little bit of my testimony in here. And uh, it's about getting your life straightened out so God can use you and uh, and getting you all fixed up. Let's pray together. Father, uh, move in our life as you bring your word to us. Move in my life and make me into the man you intended me to be. Get inside us with truth from the Bible and change us from the inside out into the people you anticipated that we should be, that you planned that we should be. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me take you back to January the 3rd, 1965. It's a Sunday. It happened to be my 16th birthday. I had a 1954 Ford in the driveway and a part-time job to support the vibrant social life that I was looking forward to. On Monday, January the 4th, 1965, I got my driver's license after passing the test in a couple feet of snow in my hometown of Flagstaff, Arizona. On Friday, January 8th, this is a big day now, okay, Jan January the 8th, 1965, a Friday, I went to my first Friday night dance after drinking some beer with my buddies in the woods, and that night, the kicking and the gouging and the mud, the blood, and the beer began. For me, at the age of 16, life was about party time. I needed to be straightened out. I got straightened out, took some time. But how does that get done? How does that work out? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, has the answer. And it's pretty simple, really. Uh, it says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. There are four action words that, uh, that answer the question, how to straighten me out. Those action words are these, trust, lean, acknowledge, make. Trust, lean, acknowledge, and make. The bottom line is this, I can trust, I can lean, and I can acknowledge, but only God can make me straight. Only God can straighten me out. That's the kind of the bottom line. So first, trust in the Lord with all your heart. My family and I were eating a meal with a friend's family in the late 1980s. And uh, we were at these people's house. I was their pastor. And we were involved in a great, great spaghetti feed. This woman made the best spaghetti I've ever eaten in my life. And, uh, and I was sitting in an older wood chair around a table with some of her family members and some of my family members. And while eating this great spaghetti with meatballs dinner, I heard the sound of wood crackling and uh, breaking apart. And it seemed like a strange sound to me in that situation. It was my chair collapsing under my weight, and I weighed quite a bit more then than I do now. Suddenly, I was laying on top of a heap of cracked, splintered wood that had been the chair I was sitting in. I had trusted the chair, but the chair was not trustworthy. When we trust in the Lord with all our heart, he was, he's not going to collapse under us. He will not collapse. He is trustworthy. You can trust it. A lot of things you can't trust, but you can trust the Lord. The idea of the heart is important for our understanding. Your heart is your inner life. It's your feelings and your thoughts. It's your intellect and it's your emotions. For a little short of a half a century, I've been walking with the Lord. Uh, sometimes it's still hard to trust my emotions and my understanding to him. Uh, and you know why that is, don't you? It's, it's because human nature, human nature wants to control things. And that's the opposite of trusting them to God. I can't control what God does with me. I have to trust him. Uh, if I trust something to God, I give him control over the thing that I trust to him. And I yield control over those things to him. That's still hard to do. Truth is that it's something I choose to do and something that he empowers me to do. He's, it'll be the same for you. This Roman soldier one time came to Jesus and uh, he was a centurion. That means that he was the commander of a hundred Roman soldiers. And he came before Jesus and asked him to come over to his house and 
heal his paralyzed servant who was suffering terribly. This guy cared about his servant. Jesus said that he'd go and heal the guy. And at that, the, the centurion said that he did not deserve to have Jesus come under his roof because he was a man under great authority. He was kind of embarrassed about that. You know what the centurion then said to Jesus? He said, just say the word and my servant will be healed. That man's faith and trust blew Jesus away. He was totally willing to trust his servant's life to simply the word of Jesus. You say it so, Jesus, it's so, you know. And we have the historical account of that in the uh, eighth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus told the guy to go home and it would be just as he believed that it would. And the text says that his servant was healed at that very hour. You know what the point is? When you really trust things to Jesus, he changes things. He makes things better. He gets them worked out. If you trust your life and the changes that need to be made to Jesus, he will change things for you according to your faith like he did for the centurion. So what is it that needs to change? You know, that can be kind of tricky sometimes. A lot of things need to change. When I was growing up, I would uh, sometime, not often, but sometimes I'd eat at the cafeteria at school. And one of the things that I noted that every Friday they gave us fish. I didn't like fish too much because it's against some people's religion to eat fish on Friday. And so you have to ask a question that would go something like this. Can eating beef on Friday make you unclean? If you eat a hamburger with beef in the middle on Friday, can that make you unclean? Uh, Jesus talked about that kind of thing in Mark chapter 7, verses 20 through 23. I want to read those verses for you. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these things come from inside and make a man unclean. You see, the things that drag us off into sin and mess up our lives don't come from outside the body. It doesn't come from what you eat. The things that destroy our life come from inside our life. Evil and the sin that comes from it is always an inside job. starts on the inside. Remember that your heart <clears throat> is all of your interior life. It's your thoughts and it's your feelings. You have to trust the interior life to the Lord so he can get inside and start fixing things up on the inside so that things change on the outside. That's how it works. Living life from the inside out is always required. If you change the inside, the outside's going to change. I had to trust in the Lord with all my heart to start getting my life straightened out. And it works that way for all of us. And you know what? I'm still getting my life straightened out. It's, it'll always be that way. Second, lean not on your own understanding. One day I was leaning on the exterior door to my office where the church I served as pastor, where, where the office I had there. And I, I leaned into it with all my weight, quite a bit more than I weigh now. <laughs> and it wasn't latched. It swung open and I fell in. I just caught myself before I fell on the floor. We have to learn to lean on the right things because the wrong things will fail us and the wrong things will dump us on the floor. Notice how God says this. Lean not on your own understanding. The English Standard Version says, do not lean on your own understanding. It's a command. God's very specific here. He is plainly telling us to not lean on our understanding of things. Now, I, listen, I spent 71 years plus trying to understand things, and then God comes along and he says, hey, West, don't lean on your understanding of things, you know. It'll dump you on the floor. You don't want to do that. In Ezekiel chapter 37, I love this chapter, God told the prophet Ezekiel to, to uh, prophesy. That means to speak forth the word of God, preach to a valley of dry bones. Prophesy to these dry bones, Ezekiel. Prophesy means speak the word of the Lord. So he started preaching to him. Ezekiel says, okay, Lord, I'll preach to the dry bones. He does. And they come together and skin forms on them and they become bodies, but just dead bodies. There was no breath in them. So God tells Ezekiel to preach to the dry bones, to proclaim the word of the Lord, to prophesy for the breath to come into them and give life to these dry bones. Ezekiel does just that, and the dry bones come to life. God says that he's going to do the same for his people. 
It's going to do the same for his people. They're as dead as a valley of dry bones. And he will breathe his spirit into them. And they will live. Now, I don't understand how God takes dead things and makes them alive. But I cannot lean on my understanding. I have to lean on God's understanding of things. He does things his way. And I, I'm not him. Neither are you. None of us are. So we have to lean on God's understanding of things. Remember when Jesus fed 5,000 people with two, five, five loaves and two fish? It says that he fed 5,000 men plus women and children. He probably fed somewhere between, you know, close to 20,000 people. Jesus had been healing people all day. And his disciples came to him and said, you ought to tell the people to go, to leave, so they could get something to eat. They haven't eaten all day. And Jesus said to the disciples, I'll just give them something to eat, you know. And the disciples said, well, look, we only have five loaves and two fish. Now, by five loaves, they mean five small biscuit-type loaves made of barley. They would be about, about the size of a silver dollar, about an inch thick, small, like a biscuit, you know. They had, they had a, a few fish and about two, two fish, very small fish, be like the size of a large sardine. We're talking about five biscuits and two sardines. You know what Jesus does next? He prays and he thanks the Father for what he does have, five biscuits and two sardines. Thanks for what we do have. Thank you, Father, for providing this. It's so easy to worry and complain about what we don't have but Jesus understood God's way. And he understood that we always want to focus on what we do have. Don't forget what you do have. You do have some things. Approach that with thanksgiving in prayer. After thanking God for the five biscuits and two sardines, Jesus told the disciples to pass out the food to the people. They did. All up to 20,000 people ate their fill. And they picked up 12 baskets, and the word for basket means large basket, full of leftovers. What if Jesus was leaning on man's understanding instead of God's understanding? Well, you'd just have hand wringing and 20,000 hungry people. He did not lean on man's understanding. He leaned on God's understanding of things. And folks, that's exactly what we need to do. This preacher was visiting farm country and it was part of a men's prayer breakfast. And he, he asked this old farmer to give, you know, Christian guy to give the prayer. Everybody took a seat and the old farmer started praying. He said, Lord, I hate buttermilk. Preacher opened one eye, kind of wondering what was going on, got a little worried. And the old farmer shouted, Lord, I hate lard. Now the preacher's really getting worried. Without missing a beat, the old farmer prayed, and Lord, you know I don't care much for raw white flour. Now the preacher really about to stand up and stop everything. And the old, old farmer continued his prayer. But Lord, when you mix them all together and bake them all up, I do love fresh biscuits. So Lord, when things come up we don't like, when life gets hard, when we just don't understand what you're saying to us, we just need to relax and wait till you're done mixing. And probably it'll be something even better than biscuits. Lean not on your own understanding assumes that we always wait until God's done mixing. And we'd never assume how God's going to handle anything. And that's hard because we like to control it. We can't. God's in control. We need to let him be in control. When we assume that we know how God would handle a thing, we're likely going to end up with 20,000 hungry people. Third, acknowledge God in all your ways. What does it mean to acknowledge God in all your ways? The concept of acknowledge is very, very important. And it means to know personally and surrender to know God in a personal way and surrender. If you acknowledge God, you know him in a personal way and you surrender to him. When I acknowledge God in all my ways, I'm saying to God that, that he's the ruler of all the ways of my life, that he owns me and he controls every area of my life. This rich young ruler came to Jesus one day and uh, he said, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus makes it clear that only one person in the universe is good, and that's God himself. So Jesus told him if he wanted to enter life, he should obey the commandments. He's talking about do the Ten Commandments. So Jesus started listing off the Ten Commandments. The, the young man interrupted him. He said, look, I've done all that. What do I still lack? Jesus said, if you really want to be perfect, sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, then come follow me. 
rich young guy had everything in place except his riches and Jesus could see him. He could see his life. He understood that about the young guy. So Jesus called him on it. And then he had the rich young man. The rich young man went away sad because he had great wealth. He wasn't willing to surrender that to the Lord. His wealth kept him from acknowledging God in all his ways. He was not willing to give the Lord ownership over everything he had, including his wealth. What is it that you're not willing to give God ownership of? Here is the truth. God cannot fix what he doesn't own. Let me tell you something. Now, he owns everything, right? But there's one thing that he did. He gave man free will, which means we get to choose whether he owns us or not. You know? Now, he'll demonstrate that he does someday, but in the meantime, he gave us free will. We can say yes or we can say no to him. And he, he cannot fix what has not been surrendered to him. And one of the hardest things in the world to do is just surrender everything to him because we lose control. We give it to him. We have to acknowledge his ownership over every area of our life. That's surrender, you know. I think about Joseph in the Old Testament. I love this guy. Uh, he told this fantastic, about these fantastic dreams to his family. They didn't like it because it implied that he would be in charge of them, over them. And so they, his brother sold him into slavery instead of killing him. He ends up in Egypt, and he belongs to one of Pharaoh's big shots, a guy named Potiphar. He was Potiphar's slave. It's obvious to me that Joseph, though he'd gone through some tough times, has acknowledged God's ownership over his life. You know why I say that? Potiphar's wife tries to get Joseph to be intimate with her, to sleep with him, to sleep with her. And she must have considered him a good-looking dude and wanted to be with him. And he refuses repeatedly, even to the point of saying no when she cried rape and he ends up tossed in prison. It, it's, like he, it's like he put his life on the altar and gave it to the Lord as a sacrifice of praise. And actually, that's what's called for. And then the Lord has all of us so that he can bless and change us. And what happens to most people, me included, all of us, we confess, like Romans 10, 9 says, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You confess Jesus is Lord and then you slip up, up after you put yourself on the altar. You know, We all slip up. You offer yourself up to Jesus as Lord. You put yourself on the altar as an offering of worship to the Lord. That's the right thing to do. We need to all do that. But for most people, Potiphar's wife comes along offers herself to you, and you crawl off the altar. Now, there are thousands of issues <clears throat> that you can be tempted with that can cause you to crawl off the altar. We all have them. When I crawl off the altar, I have to put myself back on. So does everyone else. So do you. Joseph put himself on the altar and kept himself on the altar. And when temptation came, he would not give in to the temptation so they wouldn't sin against God. That's what the scripture says. I worked with a guy from 2005, 2008, who was a good friend of mine in the car business. And he was involved in this church. Good guy, you know. He tithed, he went to church, went to Bible school, even played the drums on his praise band, you know. We're talking about the Bible one day, and I went off on surrendering to the Lord, surrendering to the Lord. And I'll never forget what he had to say in response to acknowledging God's ownership over his life. His response, well, I don't know about that. You see, there's a great difference between churchianity and Christianity. And churchianity can be ritualistic, you know, it's kind of going through the motions. But Christianity is about being surrendered to Christ as Lord, and that's what's called for. I want God to straighten me out. And if I do, I have to acknowledge him in all my ways. I have to give me to him. And what I keep finding is I keep having to give me to him. I keep having to give me back. Fourth, he will make your paths straight. When, when we trust in the Lord with all our heart and choose not to lean on our understanding and when we acknowledge his rule over our lives, then and only then can he straighten things out. And it's the work of God. He straightens things out. When the Lord has you by your trusting leaning not on your understanding and by your acknowledging his rule, then he can straighten you out. 
It's the only way that it works. Remember what Peter did when Jesus told the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane that they would all disown him that night? Peter said that he would not disown Jesus. I will not disown you. He said that he would die with him before he would disown him. And Jesus told Peter that he would deny him three times that night before the rooster crowed. Peter's sitting in the courtyard while Jesus is on trial. A servant girl looked at him and said, you were with Jesus of Galilee. What did Peter say? You don't know what you're talking about. That's once. He went out of the gateway and another girl saw him. He said, that man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Peter said, I don't know the man. That's twice. Then a group of people said, you have to be one of them. Your accent gives you away. Peter called down curses on himself and said, I don't know the man. That's three times. And immediately a rooster crowed and Peter remembered what Jesus had said. And he went out and the Bible says that he wept bitterly. Peter needs to be straightened out. He's not much different than the rest of us. Uh, you and I, we all need to be straightened out. We all need Jesus to get involved in our life and straighten us out. That's what Peter needed in that moment. Peter's in need of God straightening out the paths of his life. Well, Jesus would be beat bloody and the next day crucified on a cruel Roman cross, take the sin of the world on his body and die to pay for that sin. He would be buried in the borrowed grave of Joseph of Arimathea for three days and then be raised bodily from the dead. After the resurrection, Jesus hooked up with our buddy, Peter, and a bunch of the other disciples. who they'd, uh, they'd gone back to their previous occupation. They were commercial fishermen. They'd gone back to fishing. The disciples had been fishing all night, and Jesus and the disciples had breakfast on the beach. After breakfast, Jesus talked to Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me more than these? He's talking about the fish. Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And then Jesus asked Peter again, do you really love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Jesus asked Peter a third time, Simon, do you love me? And Peter replied, Jesus, you know everything. You know I love you. Asking the question the third time probably hurt Peter's heart because Jesus then told him again, feed my lamb. So he asked him three times. Why do you suppose Jesus asked that question three times? Because Peter denied him three times. Jesus is making sure that Peter trusts him with all of his heart, that he's not leaning on his own understanding, but on God's. And Jesus is making sure that Peter is totally acknowledging the rule of Jesus over his life. Jesus is going to get Peter straightened out because he plans to use him in a big, big way to take care of his sheep and to reach the world for Christ. Fast forward 50 days to the day of Pentecost in AD 33. The Holy Spirit came into the people of God, the church in Jerusalem. Someone had to proclaim the death of Christ to pay for sin, the resurrection of Christ to defeat sin and death forever, and the way into a saving relationship through Christ. Guess who God? chose to preach the Christ, first Christian sermon. Peter, Peter. He got Peter straightened out and he used him to introduce the planet to the good news about Jesus for the very first time. Once Peter trusted, leaned, acknowledged Christ, then the Lord got him all straightened out. He used him in a big way. That's how it works. Those are the only kind of people God has he can use. He just needs to get us straightened out and then start using us. When you and I trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our understanding, but lean on his, and when we acknowledge his ownership over our lives, then he will straighten us out and use us. I've described myself in January 1965. I carried on like that for almost seven years to the day. Moved the calendar forward to January 1972. Been out of the army for about four weeks. Uh, late in my time in the Army, I told the Lord that I recognized that things needed to change. 
told him that I wanted to go home, read the Bible, pray, and go to church. That's what I'd seen, especially in my grandpa. And I want to go. I knew that was how he's supposed to live. And I told him I wanted to go home and do that. It's mid-January, 1972. I'm up at two o'clock in the morning, and I'm reading the Bible and I'm praying and reading a book by Billy Graham. And I figured out from the Bible and from that book by Billy Graham that Jesus was supposed to be Lord of my life. And listen to what I figured out. He's called Lord 612 times in the New Testament. That's almost two times, 200 times more than he's called Jesus. And I got the picture, you know. I understood that to, uh, to make him in charge of me, that's who needs to be in charge of me, Jesus. So I got on my knees and turned me over to him. And, and I redo that every day because I know I'm still a sinner and I'm capable of crawling, crawling off the altar. And Jesus needs to be my Lord. And you have to affirm that all the time. The kicking and the gouging in the mud, the blood and the beer ended that night. Now, I'm, folks, I'm still not perfect. And I can prove it. But, and you won't be either. But you know what? God's grace is perfect. And he keeps fixing us up. That's how it works. When I finally trusted him with all my heart, leaned not on my understanding, but on his. And when I acknowledged his ownership over my life, he made my life straight and he's still doing it, which is what, how it always works. God's challenge and call to you today is to trust him with all of your heart and lean on, don't lean on your understanding, but on his understanding of things and acknowledge his ownership over you and then you give him authority over you to fix all your ways. And he will not disappoint. He will not disappoint. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for Jesus. And thank you for this truth from your word that transforms our lives, God. I pray that everyone listening and that everyone that hears this message from now on would be transformed by the by the power of Christ in their life, and that you'd fix them all up so that you could use them in a big way to impact the world for Jesus. Thank you for doing that work and continuing to do that work in my life. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you'll subscribe to my little YouTube channel, Life in the God Lane, and send it to someone else. Send this message to someone that it can help. Uh, I, I would appreciate that. And then maybe they can subscribe and get this message out to a bunch of people who need it. Um, and I will see you. This is an extra one. I did this on Sunday afternoon. I'm going to get it out to you now. And I'll put another small message in uh, tomorrow evening, Monday evening, which is kind of the standard thing that I do. Thank you for listening. Subscribe and send it to someone else so they can. God bless.